Welcome to Explore the Bible. Today we're going to look at 1 Kings chapter 15 verses 9 through 22. And this one of the hardest things in life is to, to live dedicated to God. Uh, when you have people in your family or other people who are close to you who openly oppose everything related to God, this may, this may even be more true if you were raised in a family that in the least did not follow God, or even worse, one that openly opposed God. Zechariah 1.3 tells us that the Lord of hosts declares, quote, return to me and I will return to you, end quote. Here we will see a man return the nation to God. Israel was once a united kingdom with David and then his son Solomon as king. In our last lesson, we saw the split of the kingdom after the death of Solomon with Jeroboam be became king over the northern tribes and Rehoboam became king over the, the, the tribes in the south or the tribe in the south. In our last session, we saw that the split of the kingdom after the death of Solomon with Jeroboam became king over the north. Um, both kings are still he Hebrew, excuse me, both kingdoms are still Hebrew kingdoms, Israelite kingdoms, and they both matter and both play significant role in, in redemption history. There's often open hostility and resentfulness between the two kingdoms, which sometimes breaks into skirmishes here and there, and we'll see <clears throat> some of that today. In today's passage, we're going to jump forward 30 or forward 40 years from the death of Solomon and the split of the kingdom. After the death of both Jeroboam and Rehoboam, both kingdoms have a king who only reigned for a couple of, year, a couple of years. The Dab in the north, two years, and Abijah in the south, three years. Our primary focus is going to be Asa, Esau um, in the south with an interaction with he and Basha in the north. There's a parallel account in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 15 where we're told that the, that the events of verses 11 through 15 occur after an encounter with a prophet named Azariah who tells Asha, a, man, also, sorry, that the Lord is with you while you are with him, 2 Chronicles 15 2. He is told in verse 7 to take courage, do not let your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. In the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Esau, Alshal, began to reign over Judah and reigned 41 years in Jerusalem, according to chapter 15, verses 9 through 10. After the nation split into two, the Bible often gives us timelines for one kingdom according to the synchronization with the other kingdom rather than specific calendar dates. We see here, uh, my Bible puts the date of the death of Solomon and the beginning of the reign of Jeroboam and Rehoboam at 930 BC. The 20th year of Jeroboam would be 910 BC. A 41 year reign tells us that Alshaw was king of the Southern kingdom from 910 to 869 BC. A reign of 41 years is one of the longest of all the kings. Both David and Solomon reigned for 40 years. Of the 40 kings that succeeded David and Solomon, only Azariah and Manasseh reigned longer than Ashaw, Alshaw. His mother's name was Makah, the, the daughter of Abishalom, in, according to 1510. In 15, 1 through 2, we're told that Abijah, who ruled for three years between Rehoboam and Alshaw, we, we are given the same information for both Abijah and Alshaw. His mother's name was Makah, the daughter of Abishalom, 15-2, uh, related to Abijah. In Hebrew, the word son or daughter or mother or father applies across generations. Both Ashah and Abijah, who are, both have Makah as mother in the sense of a female ancestor, and Abishalom, uh, the former of Absalom, as, as a male ancestor. Makah is a popular name in the Bible. David had a, had a wife by the same name, and their son was Absalom. According to Jewish tradition, Michal was spoken here, is actually the grandmother of Ashah, the mother of Abijah, and the wife of Rehoboam, and was the granddaughter of Absalom, the third son of David, who murdered his brother Ammon and rebelled against David. 
when we get these ancestral names, I like to look up the meanings of the names because they often, uh, often there is something being communicated in it. We have three people here. Asha means healer. Makah means oppression. Absalom means my father is peace. That's the message of the entire Bible in three words. The healer of opposition, my father is peace. The Shah did was what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as, as David, his father, had done. The Shah is a person of a different character than Solomon, Rehoboam, or Abijah before him. David is the benchmark standard for godly behavior in the Old Testament. Why is that? David did some really terrible things, right? David, like all of us, was an imperfect man. But he never allowed the things of the world to cloud his worship of God. He didn't worship other gods. He didn't commit idolatry. He didn't mix pagan worship practices with his worship of the Lord. He had an exclusive loyalty to God. It's been said that God doesn't want to be a number, excuse me. It's been said that God doesn't want to be number one on your list of 10. He wants to be number one on your list of one. That characterizes David's life. Interesting Hebrew uh, grammar feature, the word translated as did, is a common word in Hebrew. It's used over 2,600 times in the Bible. It is pronounced the same way as, as, as the name of the king, Asha, King Asha, Asa. Uh, it's, it's, it's a different word, but it sounds the same, like right and right. Right with an R and then right with a W. It's, it's called a homonym in Hebrew. This word sounds like Asha or Asha, uh, which was right. What Asha accomplished during his reign is not uh, of the importance that this statement has, that what he did was right in the eyes of the Lord. Scripture tells us in, in verse, verse 12, he put away the male prostitutes out of the land and removed all the idols his fathers had made. This is the heart, this is the heart of the matter with respect to how Asha did what was right as David had done, eliminating idolatry. Religious prostitution was part of the Canaanite fertility rituals, and Rehoboam established the practices in the temple early in his reign, according to 1424. Historians also point out that this cult prostitution had the benefit of raising funds for the temple treasury, so it had a, a practical side to it that helped the people justify it. Here's a moment of self-reflection. Is there anything in your life that has a kernel of benefit to your faith or your church, but is inherently against the will of God in your life. You can justify the activity based on, on, on that one kernel, but overall, you know, you, 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 excuse me, you now look the other way on the negative aspects. The Shaw didn't look the other way. He eliminated what was a detestable act. It's been said that an idol is anything that takes away from the supremacy of God in our lives or attempts to redefine who God is. We live in a time where there's a lot of people spending a lot of time trying to redefine traditional meanings of things. Remember Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, speaking of the Antichrist? He shall, he shall speak words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and shall, and shall think to change the time and the law. We see that in our own time, Shaw took it upon himself to stop that. In Psalms, David's song expresses understanding and gratefulness for the character of God. That's why he, that's why he is described as a man after God's own heart. Mm -hmm. Verse 13 says, he also removed Micah's mother from being queen mother because she had made abominable images for Asherah. After Shaw cut down her image and burned it in the brook of Kidron. We know very little about McCall, whether she was generally well liked throughout Judah, Judah or whether she was despised. But in either event, this is a bold move. The language suggests that McCall had made the image while Shaw was in the process of removing the idols from the land. Perhaps she did it out of spite as Shaw was, was trying to get rid of them. In any event, it's a bold move to kick your grandmother out of, out of her royal position. We see the same wordplay as is translated as made. Here is the same word as translated as did, either pronounced the same as the name of her grandson, the king, Asha. She ashawed 
an abominable image. There are a lot of references in the Old Testament to idols, images, and Asherah pole. The word translated as abominable images here is the only word used here at, and in 2 Chronicles 15, 16, which is paralleled with the story of Shah and Macaw. The Hebrew word means a horrid thing. Question, what made this particular image particularly horrid compared to all the other images and idols and Asherah poles? According to Canaanite myth, Asherah was the mother goddess who gives life uh, to 70 other Canaanite gods, including uh, Baal. The reason poles were often made in reference to her is that they symbolize the tree of life concept. According to the Biblical Archaeology Arche 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 Society, inscriptions have been found that indicate a popular pagan belief that Asherah was the wife of Yahweh uh, and helped in the creation of all things. We see here, uh, what we see here is the royal queen mother promoting a pagan concept uh, of the mother of gods in the face of her grandson while he was ridding the land of such things. The name Kidron means dark and often symbolized something ominous in the Bible. When, when idols are torn down and burned, it often happens in the Kidron Valley, a spiritually dark place. The Kidron Valley lies immediately to the east of the temple, between the temple and the Mount of Olives. David crossed the Kidron fleeing from his son Absalom, a, a picture of him heading into a dark place. In 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 23. In the only mention of the Kidron in the New Testament, Jesus crosses it with his disciples from Jerusalem to Gethsemane and immediately after uh, is betrayed by Judas in John chapter 18, verse 1. Question, what is your reaction to things that are against God among your family members? It's a difficult thing to deal with. His grandmother couldn't have been happy, but Ashaw's goal was to please God not as family members. Notice it didn't say it, what it doesn't say. It doesn't say here or in, a, or, in the, or in the parallel account in 2 Chronicles chapter 15 that a Shah had killed or publicly humiliated, had her killed or publicly humiliated. He didn't write, uh, he didn't post terrible things about her or whatever the equivalent is of his, of his Twitter page at the time. He just removed her from office. But the high places were not taken away, verse 14. It is presumed that, that these were personal altars where people made their own sacrifices to the Lord rather than the, the pagan versions of high places. Question, what was wrong with having your own personal altar to, alter, uh, to offer sacrifices to God? There's only one location authorized by God to worship and to make sacrifices. Originally, it was the tabernacle that traveled with the people throughout Exodus. The tabernacle was later replaced by the temple in Jerusalem. Building your own personal communi uh, community high place was a sign of arrogance, of doing your own thing as opposed to what, uh, as opposed to doing the things uh, God's way. The Shaw hadn't taken any action on those. Verse 14, it says, nevertheless, the heart of a Shaw was wholly true to the Lord all his days. May this be said about us in remembrance. We will never be perfect, but we can strive to be unpolluted by the things of the world in regard to our devotion to God. Question, how does this compare to the New Testament standard of salvation by grace? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, for grace you have been saved through faith, and it is not in your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. God's standard has never been about achieving perfection. It's about being devoted to him and by avoiding idols. Verse 15 says, and he brought into the house of the Lord, the sacred gifts of his father and his own sacred, sacred gifts, silver and gold and vessels. <clears throat> this is meant to serve as further evidence of, Shaw, of a shawl being devoted to God. Think of this as giving of a large portion of your inheritance to ministry, as well as a sizable portion of your own wealth. Second Chronicles chapter 14, 15, and 16 gives us additional details on the context. Judah had peace and rest from conflict for 10 years while Shaw was removing all the idols in the land. Judah was later attacked by a much larger army from Cush or Ethiopia. A Shaw cried out to the Lord God in prayer for help and were told, 
So the Lord defeated the Ethiopians before Shaw and before Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. According to that Second Chronicles 14, 12, they captured a great deal of plunder and livestock from the Ethiopians, and God gave them a great victory they couldn't have achieved on their own. Saul has, has a great festival of thanksgiving to God, giving God credit for giving them victory. The final verse in chapter 15 tells us there was no more war until the 35th year of the reign of Asha, chapter 15, verse 19. Most experts agree this should most likely read 25th. Asha died in the 27th year of Asha, uh, of Asha's reign. Verse 16 says, and there was, there was war between Asha and, and, and Bashan, uh, king of Israel, all their days. Bashan's name means stinking, revolting, or, or wicked. So right off the bat, we know that this isn't a good person. He killed Nadab, who preceded him as king after two years of his reign. Uh, 2 Chronicles 16.1 tells us in the 36th year of the reign of Bashan, Bashan Bash, Bash, became king of Israel, went up against Judah and, and built Ramon, that he might permit no one to go out or come in to King Ashaw, to Ashaw, king of Judah. Most experts agree this should most likely read 26th as above. The point of Ashaw had, uh, the point is Ashaw had peace for most of his time as king, 10 years prior to the invasion from Ethiopia and 13 or 14 years after it. This says that there was, there, there was war all the days, all their days. There is no doubt about skirmishes and resentment and hostility all of their days. Second Chronicles chapter 14, 15, and 16 gives us some additional details in the context. Uh, Judah had peace and rest from conflict for 10 years. Sorry, I lost my place there. W once again, talking about the meanings of names and locations. As we mentioned, Bashaw means stinking, revolting, or wicked. Israel means God prevails. Judah, let him be praised. Ramah, lofty place. Bashaw healer judah once again let him be praised you get a warning to the wicked what sounds like it comes from the psalms or proverbs god prevails let him be praised from a lofty place comes a healer let him be praised using the same map as last week we see ramah is outside of the northern kingdom of israel only five miles north of jerusalem ramah was the only main road out of jerusalem to the north in controlling Ramon, the Shah could isolate Judah by limiting the travel or the trade from Judah to any of the peoples in the north, and he could control anyone from the northern kingdom going to Jerusalem. To be clear, this is the Jewish nation of the north, Israel, trying to hem in the Jewish nation of the south, Judah. The north and the south were, were, were one combined nation just 30 or 40, just 30 to 40 years ago. Looking at verses 18 and 19, we see this. The Shah gave the treasures of the temple to the king of Syria to break his covenant with Basha. Notice he doesn't ask the king of Assyria to attack Basha. He simply asks that he not be aligned with Basha so that Basha doesn't feel empowered to strike out against the Shah. The giving of the temple treasury was a sign of devotion to God. So the question is, what does the taking from the treasury represent? We might think that this is a justifiable expenditure. It's only for the safety of the people, after all. Let's compare this to the story in Second Chronicles with the invasion of the Ethiopians. Judah was attacked directly by the Ethiopians. Here, they are not openly attacked, though there is a threatening presence. Second, Ashaw cried out to the Lord God in prayer for help against the Ethiopians. We don't see that here. And thirdly, God gave Judah a great victory and is credited with it in celebration over the Ethiopians. Here, Ashaw 
robs God of the opportunity to display his love and care not only for Judah, but for the people of Israel as well. Note, uh, this, is, this is the parallel account of 2 Chronicles 16. The Shah is reprimanded by Hanani for his actions in 2 Chronicles 16, 7 through 9. The Shah is trusting in a pagan foreign ruler rather than God. The Shah didn't ask Ben-Hadad to attack the cities, but that is what he did. We might call this an unintended consequence. The result of the covenant between the Shah and Ben-Hadad is that a, a pagan nation attacked and conquered some parts of the Jewish brothers of the north that forced Bashar to, be, to, to abandon the blockade at Ramon. King Bashar made a proclamation to all Judah. None was exempt, and they carried away the stones of Ramon and its temper, tim, timber, uh, verse 22. One of the reasons for the split of the nation of Israel into two, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, was the issue of forced labor. And here we see it again. King Asha built Geba of Benjamin and Metzbah. Zooming in on the original map, we can see Geba and Metzbah are on either side of Ramah. Asha enhanced defensive positions to present any further action here. So what can we possibly, what could this nearly 3,000 year old history lesson possibly teach us today? First, God expects his people to follow him wholeheartedly. Charles E. Humel uh, said, the root of all sin is self-sufficiency, independent from, independence from the rule of God, end quote. A Shah became king when the entire nation lived independent of God's rule. What does that lead to? The following after of everything that isn't God. Being wholehearted towards God doesn't mean that we won't sin. But Pastor Greg says that we will never be sinless, but we can sin less. How do we sin less? By being wholeheartedly devoted to God. That can be really hard to do in the presence of family members with open hostility towards God. My prayer is the, strength, is, is the strength from God to be evident in your life and in my life when faced with that situation. The Shah was a breath of fresh air with respect to wholehearted godliness compared to Solomon, Rehoboam, and Abijah, Abijah. He didn't grow up in an entirely godly household, yet he was an entirely godly person. Can you relate to that? Can you find hope in that? The Shah made a choice to live different, uh, in a different manner than his fathers that raised him. It didn't happen by accident. It took courage and dedication. If you grew up in a family uh, that was counter to God's will, don't let that hold you back. Don't let that keep you from living for the glory of God. Psalm 88, 11 reads, teach me your ways, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Second, we see a Shah's reform cost him something. If he, if, if he, if, if the funds from the cult prostitutes help fund the activities of the temple, that cut off the source of revenue. Perhaps that's why we're told the Shah made a sizable contribution to the temple to make up for it. Eliminating the cult activity certainly would have angered some people. Removing his grandmother from her royal position certainly would have angered her. Following God in that time cost the Shah something. In the same way, following Jesus today may cost you something. It may, it, it may be respect from people you admire. It may be financially. But we live in a world where many people would be, uh, would be more comfortable if you just forgot all about that, uh, all about that Jesus and living for God stuff. The question is, how are, how are you going to adapt to that? Like a Shaw, you may need a break from certain relationships in your life. Third, why does the writer make a point of telling us a Shaw lived wholeheartedly to God, but didn't clear out the high places? I think it's a reminder to us that nobody is perfect. 
and and that should encourage us your spiritual walk might be pretty good it might be really good but maybe you have a few high places that you haven't quite cleaned out yet it's a reminder to examine your own life realizing that there that we are still a work in progress we still have things that we need to get right but isn't it just easier to see that in other people's lives than it is in our own life may god give us the strength to clean out the high places that we haven't yet gotten to and give us some grace to and and, and give some grace to others when we see that they still have some left in their own life. Fourth, we see that a Shaw sought God is a big thing. The attack from a much larger nation. The contrast is that a Shaw didn't seek God in the situation and with the Shaw. The attack from the Ethiopians was, was an immediate and insurmountable threat. The Shah's attempt was is isolating Judah wasn't as wasn't as an immediately threatening. But Ashaw didn't seek God at all. Instead, he rationalized his own solution to the problem. Have you ever done that? I'm sorry to say that I have done I, I have done that more times than I can count. And I doubt very many of my solutions align perfectly with God's will. There's an old story of a man traveling through Africa on safari. He stumbles on the path of a lion who begins to charge at him. He immediately calls out to God, who saves him in a way he can't begin to describe. Later that same night, he's back at camp and he goes to bed. A mosquito begins to buzz around his head, annoying him and frustrating his ability to sleep. He swats at it, but he's unable to kill it. And this goes on all night long. In the morning, God says to him, you sought me in the big things, but not the little. If I, if I had a solution for the big things, wouldn't I also have a solution for the little things? An interesting search tells me that about 200 people are killed each year in lion attacks. Yet mosquitoes kill about 725,000 people each year through diseases. Sometimes it's hard for us to recognize the more significant threat. The Ethiopian attack was surely the equivalent of being charged by a lion, by a lion to a shawl. They were much bigger, which, is, which in that day almost always led to victory. I'm not saying that Bashaw was just a pesky mosquito, but the threat wasn't as, as, as immediately devastating. Why is it hard for us to seek God in the things that aren't as an immediate threat? In trying to solve the problem in our own or, or through our peers, we're bringing a vastly lesser capable solution to the problem. Why is it we bring a lesser solution to, to, to a lesser problem? Our goal is to be wholeheartedly devoted to God because he is wholeheartedly devoted to us. We have to guard our hearts when facing difficulties, whatever the size. We know this, that God is always faithful. Finally, we've said we don't have to be perfect in order to be dedicated to God. Today, we can have perfection accredited to us by faith in Jesus Christ. In Ashtal's day, the temple was, was to be the only place where worship was, was to be made. Today, we are the temple. The temple is inside of us. It's in our hearts as a believer. If, you don't, if, if, you, if you'd like to know more about that and becoming a Christian, you can reach out to us at the link below. Or maybe you would like to move, on, move from being an occasional church attendee to living a life that pleases Jesus. We would love to talk to you about that. You can reach out to us through the website listed houstonsfirst.org forward slash the hyphen loop forward slash about forward slash discover hyphen Christ. God bless, and we pray that this blesses you. Have a good day.